Hey everyone, Dusty from NVIDIA here. In this video from the Jetson AI Fundamentals, we're going to train our own object detection networks using PyTorch on board Jetson Nano. Then we'll collect our own data sets and test it on a live camera stream. So with that, let's get started a while. So go to the Jetson inference page on GitHub at the URL shown here, and go down to the retraining SSD mobile net page under uh, object detection training. And you might remember from the previous video on object detection inference, SSD mobile net was the network architecture that we used for that with the pre-trained MS Coco model. And we're gonna use that same architecture again, but just retrain it on a couple custom data sets that we're gonna use. So the first one we're gonna try is this open images data set that we can download online. And open images has a lot of different object classes in it. It has over 600 different types of objects that you can pick and choose from. And you can browse those all here in a big list and kind of explore what type of source material you're dealing with. And there's also a searchable list included here on the GitHub in case you're wondering if that object class is included with the, the data set. So what I'm gonna be doing is downloading a bunch of different types of fruits and then retraining the model on that. But you're welcome to pick and choose whichever types of classes that you're interested in, in using. If you have a particular application in mind or just want a particular kind of model. Um, so there's a script here, the open images downloader script that's included with the project and that will automatically download these images of a particular classes um, for us. So let's fire up a Docker container here, cd into your Jetson inference directory, and then use the Docker run script. Okay, and then we're gonna go into the Python slash training slash detection SSD directory. And you can see here, here's where all these uh, PyTorch training scripts and utilities live. So what we'll do is pass in a bunch of class names to this open images downloader, and then also where we want to save the data to. So you can just copy and paste this. If you do want to train on your own classes from the open images data set, you can substitute those in this string here. All right, so we'll kick this off. First, it's gonna download a bunch of annotation data, then it'll download all of the images for us. Okay, so it's done downloading. And what I will say is that for certain object classes, Open Images has really a lot of data. For example, images of people or vehicles, some of them have hundreds of gigabytes of images. When we're training on the Jetson or the Nano, you know, generally you wanna keep it less than 10,000 images to not have the training time be too high. Um, so what you can do first, I recommend, is running this downloader script with the stats only option, and that will print out exactly how many images are in the, the data set that you selected to be downloaded. And then once you know that, you can tell it to you know, only download 2,500 images or 10,000 images. I think this Fruits one I downloaded has 6,500 or so images in it. So depending on your disk space and how much time you wanna spend training, you can limit the number of images it downloads that way. Otherwise it could you know, start pulling hundreds of gigabytes on you if you train a model of people, for example. So the open images data set's really quite large. Uh, okay, so now that we got our data set, we're gonna use this train ssd.py script that uses PyTorch and retrains the model for us. So what we can do is we'll go here, do Python 3, train ssd.py, and first we're gonna pass in the directory we saved the data to, that was data slash fruit, which that uh, directory is mounted from the host into the container, so all that data set's saved for us. And then we're gonna uh, tell it where we want the trained models to live. So it'll be model slash fruit. That's another directory that's mounted from the host into the container. So all of our models will be saved for us. Uh, and then we can tell what batch size we want. The default batch size is four. Uh, but since we're running on Jetson Nano, which has 
uh, you know, a little less memory like the Jetson Nano 2 gigabyte. And, you know, object detection training is very heavy on memory usage. We're going to reduce the batch size to two and also tell it to only use um, one data loader worker thread. And next you can tell it how many epics you want it to run for. Normally that would be 30 or up to 100. In you know, lieu of time here, I'm just going to do one for illustrative purposes. All right, let's kick this off. Okay, so it's done training. And next what we want to do, like we did when we trained our image classification model, we're going to want to export it from PyTorch to Onyx so that we can load it into TensorRT and run it on a bunch of images and stuff. Um, so we'll use this Onyx export script, which is real similar to the classification one. So Onyx export, and then point it to the model directory that you chose, so model slash fruit, and it'll export it to Onyx for us. Okay, all done. And next what we'll do is use the DetectNet program like before, but with these extended command line parameters that allow us to load a custom model into it. Okay, so just run DetectNet, then our model will be models slash fruit, SSD mobile net, and then the labels is labels, uh, models slash fruit slash labels dot txt uh, then we're going to specify the input and output layers so input zero um, detectnet has two different output layers there's the confidence grid and then there's uh, the bounding box data so output coverage and output bounding boxes and then we're going to run this on a bunch of fruit test images that are included in the repo. So maybe Jetson inference, data, images, fruit, wildcard. And then we'll save this to the images test directory so we can view it here. Okay, so we'll fire this up here. All right, we see it start to run. It looks like it's getting some detections. That's really good. Prove that our retraining worked. All right, so let's go into our file explorer here and actually view these. Go data images test. Okay, here they are. These were saved from the container into the host. This one's good, it got a bunch of these. The confidence values are very high. That's a good sign. It's gonna some small ones. Interesting here, it did miss this strawberry that it isn't ripe yet. So it was only trained on ripe strawberries, apparently. Uh, got some grapes. Awesome. Uh, this is a good one. It got a bunch of different oranges in there. That's great. Got two different types of fruit in the same image. There's another one with multiple types of fruit in the same one. There's a one with a lot of different fruits in it. Alrighty. It's very good. It looks like it worked pretty well, actually, and you know, I was able to classify a bunch of these test images. Again, you're welcome to play around, iterate on this, download a bunch of new test classes, depending on what you have in mind. But what we're going to actually do next is collect our own detection data set that's totally custom and um, we're going to use this camera capture tool that we used previously to collect our own image classification data set. It just turns out this tool actually has a mode for doing detection data sets and bounding boxes too. Um, so what we'll do here is fire up the camera capture tool again. Um, point in our video device, that's dev video zero. Okay, and 
to do a detection data set as opposed to classification, you just want to change this data set type drop down to detection. And then you see there's a bunch more options that show up here. And the GUI is documented here on this page. So if you're wondering what all of these options mean below, you're able to figure out what all of those mean. Okay, so first it wants this, the path and the path to the labels of your data set. So let's go in here and create a new directory for our data set. So we'll store it to Python training SSD, the data directory. Let's create a new folder. So what I'm gonna do is I have a bunch of these little tractor toys that I'm gonna train this on. And a little tidbit about myself, I uh, grew up on a dairy farm actually, so I have a bunch of these toys left over from when I was a kid. And I'm gonna call my data set tractors okay so we'll go in here and while we're at it let's make our labels file so call that labels.txt and open this in a text editor here and so my data set's going to have four classes there's a john deere there's cat for caterpillar there is a case international and then there's just like a flatbed truck that i have Okay, save that out. Then go back into the GUI here and point it to that path that we created. So that'll be under sort data fruit, or data tractors this time. And point it to your label file here. Okay, so we'll start putting the object in front of the camera. And there's a couple ways you can use this tool. One, if you have live objects that you're trying to um, annotate, like a person in front of the camera, generally you would want to freeze the frame. So you can press the freeze button here, that will then freeze the camera frame, and you can start drawing bounding boxes over things. And once you draw a bounding box, you'll see this entry here, and you can change the class of that bounding box by changing this dropdown. And there's a couple other options down here. There's save on unfreeze that will automatically save this image and annotation when you go to unfreeze it. There's clear on unfreeze that will clear all the bounding boxes when you unfreeze it. I'm gonna uncheck that because the way I like to work is um, you know, move the object around and keep the bounding box in so I don't have to redraw it all from scratch every time. And then there's the merge sets option which that duplicates the data between train, val, and test data sets here. And in a production model, you don't want to use that. You want to maintain complete independence between those data sets. But just for this test example, it makes it go a lot faster just to, you know, essentially have one data set. Uh, so then you can unfreeze the image, it'll save it, and, you know, then move it around a little bit, move the bounding box to the new location, you can resize them here, uh, then press the save button again. And it's generally pretty important to keep the bounding box pretty tight around the object, as well as, you know, getting a lot of different viewpoints and orientations of the objects. If you're doing a real data set, you would want to have multiple objects on screen at the same time. For example, you know, collecting multiple of these here. So you can, uh, you can draw multiple bounding boxes and change them. In my example here, I'm not going to do too many that actually have multiple because it really increases the number of images and I'm just going to collect 100 images per class here and uh, that should be enough to do a test example. In reality, you know, you can get into several thousands of images pretty easily just by you know, running lots of different orientations and how many different objects are on screen at the same time, different camera viewpoints, different backgrounds. So in order to make a really robust model, you know, you want to have several thousands of images. Uh, but for this test, I'm just going to go and collect a hundred. So I'm going to get set up a while for collecting a bunch of this data now.
Okay, so I've collected uh, 400 images in my data set, 100 for each object class. So we can shut down this tool now. And what we're going to do is retrain the network the same way we did previously. The only difference is, is we're going to specify this data set type equals VOC uh, argument, which just means the it's in Pascal VOC data set format which you can see here what that means is there's just a couple of different folders. Uh, there's the annotations, there's all of the images, and then a list of all the images for each of the training val and test set. And the annotations are just in XML here that you can open and check these out. So uh, it tells you what the image file name is and then all of the objects in there and what their bounded box is. And this is the, referred to as the Pascal VOC format, which comes from that very popular Pascal data set. It just turns out this is easier format to, to work with than the open images data set, which was made to be, you know, a very huge data set. So this one's much more manageable. So we will just run this again, uh, but use this data set type flag and point it to our new data set as opposed to the fruits one that we previously downloaded. Okay, so let's run Python 3 train ssd.py, use the data set type equals VOC, and then we're gonna point it to our data set, so that would be data tractors in my case. And the model directory I'm gonna output this to is models, tractors, and let's specify the same batch size of two and the data loader workers of one that we used last time. I'm just gonna train this for one epic, but you know you can do as much as you want, 30, 100. The, generally these custom data sets that you create yourself are smaller and will train faster than the ones that you might download from online. Okay, fire that up. Okay, so it's finished training. What we'll do next is export it from PyTorch to Onyx again. So Python 3, Onyx export to Py, point it to the same model there, models, tractors. And once this is exported, we'll be able to load it with TensorRT into our camera program. Okay, all done. Now we'll just use a very similar command line that we did with the fruits uh, test, except we're gonna specify a camera device here instead of some file names. So detectnet model equals models tractors SSD mobile net, then labels equals models tractors labels.txt. What I will say about the labels is that it's important to use the label file that gets saved into the models directory when you're running the inference because when you train the model with PyTorch, it adds a background class as the first class. And if instead you try to load the labels file from your data set that you originally created that has no background class, then when you're doing the inferencing, you know, your labels will be mismatched. So when you're running this inferencing test, use the labels file that gets saved automatically into your models folder. Okay, then specify the input and output layers here. Input blob equals input zero. The coverage and the bounding boxes. Okay, and my camera is dev video zero. Let's fire this up. All right, so we got the truck there. That's a good start. Tried a bunch of different orientations here. All right, let's try a different one. Let's try the John Deere. All righty, very good. 
It's doing pretty well, actually, for only having 100 images per class. It's like very certain that these are the objects. I guess if I did this again, I would put my arm in the picture a couple times because it seems it, I didn't have any images with my hand in there, actually. So you could always retrain it like that. It would be more robust against the hand. Okay, let's try this earth mover here. All right. Very good. All right, and the last one here. Let's try the case. Perfect, okay. So it's recognizing all of the object classes. That's a, what we wanted. All right. So I had mentioned previously I wasn't collecting any images that had multiple objects per image, per labeled image, just to keep the complexity down because otherwise you could be there all day. Uh, doing these in all different combinations and such. Um, but I'm just curious to see if it can actually still do multiple. Okay, so it's got two there. All right, it's got three. And it's able to do all of them. That's awesome. So even though it wasn't trained having all of these in the same image, it's able to, to get those um, just from its independent training. So it's uh, quite robust, actually. Um, okay, so another little experiment that I'm gonna try here is I have a couple of other tractors that they're still like a John Deere and a Caterpillar, and here's like a case, uh, but they're different than the tractors that I collected the data on and trained the network with. So let's see if it's able to, you know, adapt itself and, wow, okay, 100% sure. So it seems like if it, it was trained on images of a green tractor that we told it was John Deere, and now if it sees other green tractors like that, then it, and it's, it's like 100% sure. That's awesome. Okay, so here's another one. This is a cat bulldozer, but I trained it on a different type of caterpillar. Sweet. Okay, and let's try this other. Okay, okay, it's got that, and I actually have a little wagon for this guy. Okay, it even does, even got the wagon on there. Funny. Okay, let's see if this works with having multiple. Okay, it's got that. Let's see about the, the John Deere here. Maybe that. We're getting a little. There we go. Awesome. So it's really done quite well at identifying. Obviously, it thinks green tractors, John Deere. Yellow, Caterpillar, Red, Case International. So it all depends on what you train it on and you, know, you can train it on whatever types of objects you'd like. If you have a particular application or demo or robot or something in mind that you wanna do, you can train it to detect whatever. So, alrighty. Well, that brings us to the end of this object detection retraining video. And you know, thanks a lot for joining us and we'll see you next time. I'm Dusty from NVIDIA. To learn more, visit nvidia.com slash DLI or email us at nvdli at nvidia.com.